Today we're going to talk about extreme makeovers. And so we'll, we're going to have uh, extreme makeover church edition. All right, so uh, how many of you uh, watch this uh, show, uh, Extreme uh, Makeover? Are you ready for a change? Yes. So they do different makeovers. They do personal makeovers, uh, in which they change a person like you see here on this slide. And they have uh, all kinds of uh, different uh, uh, shows now. They have home makeovers, they have neighborhood makeovers, they have restaurant makeovers. And it's very entertaining. So I love the home makeover, especially when, when you, you have uh, you know, a, a family, they recognize in the community, they're so poor, and then the team comes and they give them these amazing mansions. It's like a palace and the kids are all happy. And uh, So my question is, are you ready for an extreme makeover? I'm not talking about physically, though. Uh, sometimes I, 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 would, uh, I would mind to put some more hair or... You know, more biceps or something like that, <laughs> or lose some weight. I'm not talking about a physical makeover, but in, uh, in our life, there's seasons in which the Lord does something new. And what I realize as we start here at Passion is that we have a group of people that are under a process of, of, uh, um, of change and of, of improvement. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, in John chapter 14 in verse 2, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So, guess what? Jesus is doing an extreme makeover in the place we call heaven. Because he's preparing a place for us. Yes. So, so uh, the, the place wasn't ready. Jesus is preparing the place for us. And he, you better be sure that he's going to prepare an awesome place for you. How many of you received this? Amen. Oh yeah, that's good. So, uh, and we know that um, there's uh, uh, also a, a, a process in which we are involved and God called it uh, His church, His temple, His house. And we're part of that project. So, uh, as Jesus came, Jesus came to do an extreme makeover in terms of, of God's house. Because God's house at the point when Jesus came was for the Jews and was an exclusive of a small uh, people, of a nation. And then through Jesus Christ, that barrier was broken. And that there's an extreme makeover in terms of, of worship. And, and so people realized that, uh, that God loves us no matter our background, our race, the color of our skin, our uh, education, you know, we, we, God is inclusive and He's doing this. Though through the ages, uh, people built different organizations and different churches. And, uh, and churches uh, have, have flaws, and like we have our own flaws, and God is always in the process of rebuilding and renovating. Amen? Amen. So, and we are His workmanship. We are His workers. And uh, God ha has a, a dream of a perfect church. And that dream, it's kind of an, an utopia, the perfect church. But that's God's dream. And He mentioned uh, this dream like a, a bride that is so perfect, she has no spot or wrinkle. It's a perfect, perfect bride. And so this is the image that God gives in Scripture about the church. It's not that we're going to be all, all without wrinkles, though uh, I would appreciate that, <laughs> and no, no spots and nothing, but what God is talking, it's about a spiritual renewal. So I want to be involved in, in renewal, in revival and in renewal. So we need to do that one person at a time. Now let's think about Jesus. Remember that Jesus encountered the possessed man? And this was... Uh, uh, um, they crossed the lake across from, uh, from Galilee and they reached, reached the shore and they encountered a man that was possessed by demons and he lived in the graveyard and uh, the scripture says that this man uh, even beat himself 
and he beat other people, and uh, it was something horrible to see because the, the, he, he wasn't sociable at all. He couldn't be with other people, so he had to live in the graveyard. He was completely demon-possessed. People were afraid of him. So Jesus comes to find this man and to do an extreme makeover in this man. <laughs> what a makeover. <laughs> so uh, Jesus casts the demons out, and the demons ask to enter the pig. Uh, uh, and um, and we know what happened. The demons came out. They went to the pigs, and then the pigs were so upset that they committed suicide. <laughs> so there was a mass suicide. <laughs> Not even the pigs wanted, you know, to, to have these demons. And think about this: some people they, they enjoy living with demons that not even pigs want to <laughs> want to uh, you know to get. And so so here's here's this uh, amazing extreme makeover that happens in Galilee. So now this man is sitting down. He's uh, perfectly uh, groomed. He's well dressed, and everybody is looking at the man. But guess what? Now they're afraid. Yeah. Now they're afraid. Not only they're afraid of the man, but they're afraid of Jesus. And, and they begged him to leave that region. He said, can you please leave? Can you please leave? Can you imagine ask Jesus to leave? But, but this is what our society is also doing. And we need to understand it. So when we start walking with God and there's extreme makeovers, people get uh, scared. Because they say, whoa, what, what is this? You know, something is wrong here. Something strange. This is not normal. So let's leave Jesus out of this. So this is the situation in which the world is in. And, and we're in this world, and we need to understand the world. And at uh, and certain times, uh, you, you know, I'm going to read just the scripture. It says on Luke 8.35, the people went out to see what had, what, uh, had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man whom the demons had, go had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. I'll be happy. <laughs> you know, why were they frightened? Why were they frightened? Because to them this was unreal, was unacceptable, and it was scary. Because they knew that man all the time. And they had never seen something like this. But we know that eventually God used this makeover uh, during the times of Acts of the Apostles to do a big revival in that area. So, uh, certain times we don't see the purpose of God immediately, but when there's an extreme makeover, there's always a purpose. Now, when I came to Christ, God did an extreme makeover in me. In fact, it was so ra radical that certain members of my family stopped talking to me. So when I, when I was doing uh, drugs and, and uh, my life was messed up, they said, oh, poor him, you know, he's the black sheep of the family. You know, we don't want anything to, to do with him. And when God did the makeover, they started to say, what? He rejected the holy church? <laughs> now, now he's not a Roman Catholic anymore? I was never Roman Catholic. Just because I was baptized. But suddenly I, I found Jesus. And I tried to explain, listen, this is not about changing uh, you know my 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 shirt and now I have another club and I change from a church to another no I had an encounter with Jesus Amen. and it happened that I didn't found Jesus in the Roman Catholic Church if I did I would have stayed there but I found him somewhere else mm -hmm. so I need to, to be where Jesus wants me Amen. and this extreme makeover caused some rejection rejection in my family it was so radical that I had some uh, magazines uh, at the time doing uh, full page articles uh, with my testimony and delivered from, from drugs, and I would say, Jesus did it. And they would say, well, even though he says Jesus did it, something happened here. <laughs> and, you know, when there's an extreme makeover, uh, and when God does it, there's always a purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to tune into that purpose. Now, this doesn't happen just at salvation. And we read this verse last week, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So we, we've seen last week, this is not just for the experience of salvation. But certain times, at points in our life, we need a change. We need to change. We need something to happen. And so many times we ask God and we say, God, what, what's, what's wrong? What, what, what's going on, God? You know, I, I, I need an answer. I need an, you don't need an answer. You don't need an answer. You just need God 
to be God in your life and be willing and, and ready to change. Now, whenever there is something that God does, He does a blueprint. You know what's a blueprint? I have this slide of a blueprint. Uh, it doesn't seem blue, but uh, it's very blue here on the computer. Uh, but when there's a blueprint, a blueprint, it's a plan. It's a plan. So when, when you're building a, a house, you can improvise, you know? Uh, I, I know that some of you do renovations, hey, Marcus. <laughs> so sometimes you do a renovation, you look at, the, a, at a place and say, okay, so I can do a fireplace here, I can do this there, I can do that over there. And sometimes you don't write the blueprint when there's, there's something small. Now, when there's something big, you need the blueprint. You need a plan. You need to have the vision of what, what is the final product. What is the, 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 the whole building. Now, God has a blueprint for His church. And we're part of that blueprint. Individually. But God has also a blueprint for our personal lives. He has plans for us. And, and even though we don't understand those plans, He sometimes have, has to knock some walls in our life. He has sometimes to destroy certain uh, uh, parts of the building of our life because He wants to build something new and something fresh. Hello? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know about you, I prefer to live in a new home rather than in an old house. I had the experience of both many times. Most of the homes uh, I had recently are new homes, and I'm so glad. I'm so grateful to the Lord because, uh, you know, we have homes that we couldn't get rid of the, of the mice, uh, uh, not without a cat, and we have homes that we have to constantly, you know, fix the, the electrical power and the pipe and then the kitchen and then this, and it's a never-ending thing. An old, an old structure, it's, uh, we can mend it. But gets to a point, you need a bulldozer. You need to do something new. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> I remember when, when we planted a church in uh, Toronto, and then I bought this building. I was so happy with that building. It was kind of an odd building, because uh, it wasn't that big. Maybe it seated 150 people. It was a, a church close to Dufferin Mall. And, uh, and th there, there was kind of a, a, a wire holding the building. And uh, I wasn't an expert in buildings. And uh, after we bought the building, I said, okay, let's remove this, this uh, wire, this cable. They told me, if you remove the cable, the building will collapse. I said, really? So then we started to repair. And uh, I thought, there's no, no big deal, just a few re uh, things to repair. Well, <laughs> after a month, I entered the building. There's no floor, because the, the whole floor had to be removed. And we worked so much in that building, it was a lot more than building a new one. So I, I know a little bit about buildings with the experience of, a, of a acquiring old buildings and trying to renew them. Now, our life, it's like a house. And we're structured in a certain way. The older we are, the harder it is for us to change. Hello? <laughs> How many young people we have here? Come on, everybody! <laughs> you can be young at heart! Eh? <laughs> so, God has a blueprint, and He has a blueprint for the new you. So, what we need to, to do if you're going to undergo an extreme makeover with God, it's ask the Lord, Lord, really, what do you have for me? What do you want me to do? And sometimes it's not very clear. It's like Joseph. He knew he was going to reach into a position of leadership. But he had to undergo, you know, uh, prison and slavery and so many hardships in life until suddenly God changed everything, you know, in the blink of an eye. And uh, we keep, some of us keep expecting God to do that in the blink of an eye. But if we're not positioned for change, he will not be able to produce the good things he has for us. Now, I will go on this uh, uh, over and over, but let's read this foundational scripture for today, which is Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. And this is the English Standard Version translation. It says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. I love this verse. Let's re read the next one. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
So what does this mean? Let's dissect, let's analyze this scripture. First, the verse that we all love, that all things work together for our own good. I love this verse, but often I'm remembered of the verse when I'm going through trials and tribulations. So, uh, you know, there's a loss, there's something that happens and someone will come, brother, you know, all things work together for the good. And when that happens, we're not really interested <laughs> you know, in that stuff. We, we, want, we want really the good and we don't want the bad. We want, uh, you know, it's, that's why in Canada, when we buy fish, there's no fish bones there. You know, <laughs> but if you want real fish, good fish, there are some fish bones in it you will have to get rid of. <laughs> not the, the, the kind of uh, we have here. And, and, but then when we get to verse 29, we have the key to understand God's blueprint for us. And God says that uh, we predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. What, what does this mean to be conformed? Now, to become conf conformed, to conform, is to, sh to change shape. Shape. So we need to be shape shifters. <laughs> okay? <laughs> yes, in the spirit. We need to change from Tony, from Wendy, from Paul, from Helen, from Judy. We need to change into the image of His Son. Well, uh, and those who trust Christ, we, uh, we need also to see this uh, as, as God's blueprint because God predestined us. So I don't know if you believe in destiny. Uh, I believe in destiny in God's way, not destiny as some people try to explain it. But uh, being predestined, it's not that, that everything that happens in our life is already written. No, we have our free will. To be predestined doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. We just need to allow things to happen and it doesn't matter what we do, it's going to happen that way. No, it's not like this. God predestined us to be conformed to His Son. So that's God's blueprint for us. Now, people that have a distorted vision of Jesus Christ, they do stupid things. Like I've seen people being crucified. They crucify themselves. I've seen people, you know, um, beating themselves uh, to have the same kind of suffering that Christ had. I've seen all sorts of people doing all, uh, stupid things because they want to please God in those ways. Now to be conformed to the image of His Son is something deeper that happens from the inside. Mm -hmm. Alright? So, um, you, you go to a bookstore and you have the, in the bookstore you have that self-help section of books. And if you go to a Christian bookstore, pretty much, I'll say, 80% uh, of the books are self-help and 20% doctrine. But Christians, they have all kinds of books and churches are uh, 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 walking deeper and deeper into material, materialism and material things. So just teaching people how they can improve their lives. And nothing wrong with that. I'm not against it. Actually, I'm in favor of improving our lives. However, our faith shouldn't be based on improving our life in the things we can do. Uh, but uh, or how can we get out of misery and how can we achieve this or achieve that Christianity is something different now uh, we got it all wrong because we were not called to be successful I'm going to say this very carefully we were not called to be successful and f free of trouble but we were called to be like Christ mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this may sh shock some of you <laughs> because, um, you know, lately churches only teach you how to be successful. Mm -hmm. You are not called to be successful. You are called to be like Christ. Mm -hmm. And to be like Christ is, uh, is the blueprint. Mm -hmm. So we need to, to develop a new role model. Our role model shouldn't be a pastor or uh, Joyce Myers, mm -hmm. or uh, you know this uh, preacher, or that one. Mm -hmm. That's not our model. Those are good role models, but our 
pattern, the model we, we need to have is Christ. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. So, we, uh, nothing wrong about self-help and improving our life and all that. But, but if a church, we, we come to church just to improve our life, we're getting it wrong. Now, uh, some of you are business owners, soon are, uh, some are soon to be business owners, and I want you to be successful. So don't get me wrong. And when we're like Christ, we can be successful. But if we really want an extreme makeover in our life, we need to, to, to change from the inside up. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's move a little bit further. Let's read in Ephesians 4.22, and this is a, a translation, the message, which is a common language. And it says, take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God actually uh, reproduces His character in you. Oh, I love this translation. It's so clear, right? Unbelievably clear. It says, uh, an, a completely new way of life. And you might think, well, I already have a new way of life since I accepted Jesus. I, I don't go to bars. Uh, I don't drink too much. Uh, I don't uh, uh, curse as much. Uh, I, you know, I restrain myself from going to different places. You get it wrong. You know, Th those things m might work if you want to be a religious person. But in order to have God's bl blueprint, as it says here, God accurately reproduces his character in you. That's something deeper. Character, it's what we need to have. We need to have God's character in us. So it's not about the way we look. It's not about the way we dress. It's not about the way we talk. Of course, God wants us to be successful. But above all, He wants to reproduce accurately His character in us. You know, I, I already bought cheap imitations of stuff, and I bought good replicas. Uh, I was visiting my, my father, and he still has a, a replica of a Rolex that I got him. <laughs> I told him, this is not the real deal. But the, that watch, it's so perfect. They did the perfect weight. They did, you know, they covered with gold. You know, it, it's, you know, any gypsy can sell that Rolex for the real thing. <laughs> I mean, if you look at that Rolex, it's the real deal. The weight, the stamps, you can go with a, with a magnifier. You cannot find, you know, difference. It's an accurate reproduction. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a replica. So it's like the original, only doesn't have the noble materials and it wasn't built by Rolex. So I, I got it at a, at a very good price in South America. So, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, when you compare with the real one, even an expert can be fooled. Even an expert. But if you take this watch to, to the maker, the maker will tell you, this is not the real deal. It may look like the real deal. It's like, the, you know, my, my daughter bought some uh, Bose headphones uh, as a Christmas gift to his uh, boyfriend, and she found it so cheap on, on eBay, and, uh, and there were bows, you know, the packaging was bows, everything was bows. When they broke and we took them to the bow store, they said, we've never seen anything so uh, perfectly, uh, you know, done, but it's not the real deal, because the, the wiring, it's a little bit thinner. Ooh. So, so, so at the factory they were able to, to tell, and the sound was great, it sounded like the Bose headphones. It was great, it's a replica. In fact, you know, I receive sometimes emails from China wanting to sell me, uh, you know, Canon cameras, you know, good cameras for 40 bucks, $40. And that camera costs 600. Uh, you know, uh, at, uh, at Costco, so if you go to another place, maybe a thousand, they sell me for forty dollars. And you look at the camera, it's like the real deal, but it's not the real deal. Now, the problem with church today, it's that it's very close to God's blueprint, but we're missing something. Because it has to be God 
doing this in us. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it shouldn't be, you know, by our own invention. Mm -hmm. And when God does it in us, mm -hmm. then certain things happen. Mm -hmm. Miracles. Mm -hmm. Miracles happen. Uh, supernatural breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. And becoming like Christ does not mean to lose our personality. You see, uh, there's a difference. Oh, I have a white slide there. There's a difference between personality and character. Uh, you have a house there, and character is the foundation. Personality is what you see on the top. So it's not a, a change of personality. It's a change of character. So God uh, allows us to be who we are. So, so you're very unique. I'm unique. So, and we don't lose our uniqueness by having our character change. But when our character changes, then we cannot see a people suffer, suffer, a person suffer without trying to help. Then we know that we need to do something more for the kingdom. Then we know, as the Holy Spirit tells us, you should give. And then we give, you know, because it's built in, in our character. And when God builds these things in our character, then supernaturally, you know, doors open. We're, we're naturally successful. But our ultimate goal is not to be successful. Our ultimate goal is to do God's will. All right, so I'm almost finishing. Uh, and let me just go to a practical part. Now, we need a new calendar in our life. So how many of you know the calendar BC and AD? Before Christ and after death. Okay, so that's what people think, but it's not. I'm going to just to explain what it what is it. Because people think, well, it's before Christ, AC, and uh, BC, before Christ, and after death. Actually, it's not after death, but it refers to Anno Domine, which is a, a Latin expression, which is the year of the Lord, the year of the Lord. So, so uh, uh, when we look at the calendar, people say, oh, there's a difference of about maybe 6 to 12 years between, you know, the birth of Jesus and the, and the death of Jesus. And so uh, it's, it's very confusing how people try to analyze this. And if you notice, more and more, uh, they're trying to, to push other calendars. Now they're trying to push the Chinese calendar to us. And if you go to s several stores, Many stores, I've noticed this all over. They put, this is the year of the snake. Yeah. The year of the snake. The year of the snake. The year of the snake. And you go to stores, some stores they, they even have on the counter. Yes. Actually, it was the post office. If you go to Canada post office, mm -hmm. right in the counter, the year of the snake. The year of the snake. The year of the snake. Let, let's kill the snake. <laughs> and they try to push different calendars. Why? Uh, you know, why does the world have the calendar we do have? Because Christians recognize that the most important event in history Amen. was, you know, Jesus. Amen. Jesus. So, before Christ, there's a calendar. And after Christ, there's another calendar. So, in fact, it's A.D., it's Anu Domine, or the year of the Lord. It's what, what it means. And uh, the, the purpose of dating, like this, is to acknowledge the most important event in history. Amen. You see, politicians now, they talk about what happened in 9-11, the United States, and they talk before 9-11 and after 9-11. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Yeah. But they didn't change the calendar. However, it was very meaningful in terms of, of uh, security in our society. So uh, before World War II and after World War II, you know, before uh, Stalin and after Stalin and all these things. Now, if we want really to ask God to do an extreme makeover in our lives, we need a new personal calendar. And our calendar should be before Christ and the year of the Lord. Okay, now you might think, well, but I came to Christ when I was a young lad or I was a young girl. I came to the Lord, so, so this has no meaning to me. Yes, it does. 
because many times in life we, re we really need a new beginning. Some of you have uh, problems in your family. So, some went through divorce or the death of a loved one. And when we think about it, when we try to do something new in our strength, we're doomed to fail. By the grace of God, He can allow us to succeed. But when we have Jesus in our life, the most important thing we need to have is to, to have the, the year of the Lord in our life. What, what is the year of the Lord? I'm not going to read, but those of you that are taking notes, in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, talks about the year of, of the Lord. Uh, it, it says that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Philippians says that every tongue shall confess. So, so when we start to confess and to bow our knees to, to, to the Lord, that's when we live in the year of the Lord. You see, Jesus came to announce freedom to the captives and the year of the Lord. What is the year of the Lord? Year, or uh, the, word, the word year, it's, uh, well, in, in Greek, it's not year, it's ion, which means era. So, so it's a new age, a new age, a new era. And we avoid this term new age as Christians because it's connotated with, you know, some uh, philosophies. But in fact, it's the Bible that brings the concept of the new age, not the, the witchcraft societies and all these people. But we, we should own these uh, terms. Amen. We should own them. Yeah. Own them back. Yeah. You know? Jehovah is not a bad word. No. Okay? New age is not a bad word. No, we need to appropriate what belongs to the Lord. But to start a new life right now, we need the year of the Lord. Now I conclude with this uh, scripture. In Matthew uh, 4 uh, and uh, verses 18 to 22, Jesus was talking to, to, uh, to the first disciples and then he uh, challenged them. And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Is this an extreme makeover? Yeah. Well, they continue to be fishers so it, that's their nature, but the purpose is changed. You're not going to catch fish, you're going to catch souls. All right? And you're not going to catch them for yourself, you're going to catch them for the Lord. And, and, and so they decided to, to obey. Whenever we have a situation, a major uh, makeover in our lives, we undergo crisis. There's crisis. We can go through a financial crisis, job crisis, family crisis, a personality crisis. There's all sorts of crises that we undergo. And when we face a crisis, when we're under that stress, we, we really don't like it. And we, we think that God abandoned us. But listen, that's why it says that all things contribute to your good. Why? Because verse 19, uh, as we read, tells us the, you know, the answer. Because He's conforming us to the image of His Son. Amen. So, so in order to receive the new, we need to get rid of the old. So uh, after your makeover, you, you're, you're, uh, you need to have the, the vision that God is the judge. And as your judge, nobody wants to, to be caught uh, in a situation in which you feel that you're imprisoned in your life. There's no way out. Jail is not a nice place to be. It's not a good place. It's not where you want to be. But you need to decide today, who will you serve? Because who you, uh, you will serve, it will determine God's justice in your life. And you might be in a situation that's not pleasant, and you're counting the days, you know, one more week, one more week, I'm still in this situation, another day, and another day, and another day, and another month, and the bills come, and oh, it's March again, oh, I've survived, and another one, and another one, and oh, I survived again, and, uh, and uh, survival mode, it's not the best that God has for you. 
But when we're in survival mode, God is shaping us into the, into the image of His Son. So the decision uh, that I'm going to challenge you this morning is very, very important. It's not to follow Christ because I believe most of you that are here, you're already following Christ. But it's the decision to allow God to be God in your life. Yes. And you might say, what, what, what do you mean with that? What I mean is that God wants to change and shift the paradigm of your life. God can do it like this. He's the one that in a blink of an eye, can place you in a position that you've never imagined. He's the one that can take you from jail to presidency. He's the one who can take you, you know, from a nation to another nation and just build you there to become successful. But that's, you know, whatever happens with our life, you know, our possessions, our money, our dreams, our goals, we need to bring them to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am, and we need to show ourselves empty-handed before the Lord. We all have talents, we have things, we have uh, assets, stuff that we think we own, but ultimately, the same way we arrived here on earth, we will leave. Amen. You arrive with nothing, you will live with nothing. So whatever you have now, it's a privilege. Your family, it's a privilege. Being here, it's a privilege. God wants to give you a breakthrough, but you need to have an extreme makeover. Now, if I want to be more like Christ, you know, I, I want to flow in miracles like Christ. I want to, uh, uh, you know, Christ spent his life ministering to others. Think about it. And he told the disciples, if you follow me, you will be successful, rich, cardinals, bishops, you know, Pope. <laughs> Peter, you're going to become the Pope. It's not what he said. He said, follow me and I will make you just as I am. Just as I am. So, uh, so God will open doors, and you can be uh, very successful. That's that's really good. Uh, I want everyone to be successful, but that's not God's plan for you. God's plan for you is not to be successful; it's to be like Christ. Amen. 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 Just yesterday, you know, I, I had the message uh, done, and I turned on uh, the TV, and there's a, a show on CNN, and they're showing this uh, young girl that uh, was bullied in school uh, because uh, her nose was uh, a little bit to the side and they were showing that this charity paid for her plastic surgery. And, and so they showed the girl and the nose was twisted and the ear was bigger than the other one and the, how the, the face was like, you know, kind of uh, distorted. Uh, not, not very, very bad, actually she was a pretty girl. And they, they, they had this doctor, Sanjay Gupta, you know, showing, you know, this charity is so great, $40,000 they paid for the girl to have this makeover. And then they show the girl now, years later, yeah, she's, she's now a, a young woman, very beautiful, and they're saying, oh, what a great thing, you know, because she was bullied, they paid for her makeover, and now she's normal. Now, what's normal in God's kingdom? <laughs> it's not what's normal in church. Church is something. God's kingdom is another thing. Okay? So this is why, uh, you know, I, I dream with this church of people that are transformed by God, that, that love God, love God, love the house of God, and they're all about God, not the institution. Amen. The institution is important, but God is more important. Amen. And when you're, you're there, then you're successful in everything you do. Then you have the promises of God. God says, whatever you put your hands to, I'm there to bless. Amen. Oh, wow, I want that. <laughs> because it doesn't matter what you do. If you do cleaning or construction or accounting or whatever you do, when you have God's character in you, whatever you lay your hands, God is there to bless. Amen. Either you build houses, you build websites, you build uh, uh, schools, you build whatever, God will bless you. 
So, are you ready for the extreme makeover? Yeah. So something spiritual is going, is going to, to happen here. You're not going to see it, but it's the greatest miracle of them all. It's God's makeover. Yeah. And it's when you're in the point of desperation that this works better. Yeah. <laughs> where you, where you, you're desperate. Lord, I'm desperate for change. It's when you're desperate that you let go of all things and you're willing, you know, to move to a different town, are you willing, you know, to move to a different job, are you willing to move to a different church, are you willing to move to a different... But every time an extreme makeover happens, you lose something. You lose something. And now this is so sad. <laughs> you lose something. So, and why is that? Because we're so attached sometimes to things that this doesn't allow us to have our full trust in God. So we undergo seasons of drought, seasons of deserts, uh, you know, difficult times in our life, so then the glory of God is manifested.